Good afternoon, everyone. Are you well? Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Kendall Mountain Festival and the Book Festival, which is a wonderful umbrella of our overall programme here. There will be a book signing straight after this event, and you will also be able to pur purchase the book at our wonderful bookshop outside the, art, the Arts Centre, just here. Please, can you switch off all phones, and our wonderful volunteers are here for you if you need any assistance throughout the session. My name is Emily Lyons, and I'm one of the production coordinators here at the festival. And I'm honoured to be joined today by Katie Carr, author of Moderate, Becoming Good Later. So, for anyone in the audience that hasn't had the pleasure of reading your book, can you tell us about the book and why you wrote it? Yeah, so the book is actually my brother's story, but it's my book. And there's a bit of a sad story behind that, which I'll get to. Um, my brother set off in 2018 to sea kayak in all areas of the shipping forecast. Um, one of the reasons he did this was because my other brother Marcus died the year before and he needed a way of dealing with that and also was looking for another adventure. So the book is really his story, it's told in his voice and it starts with my, brother's, my first brother's death and then continues through his journey, ending Sadly, with Toby's death, um, he, both of my brothers had Fanconi anemia, which is a life-limiting disease, um, which means that you don't tend to live beyond middle age. So both of them knew that they weren't going to live into old age. And they lived with this vision of, well, let's make the most of life while we can. And that's one of the key things that I wanted to get into the book. Um, so, yeah, it's Toby's story of trying to see kayak in all the areas of the shipping forecast. Let's talk a bit more about that adventure. You have a reading to get start, started that you'd like to share. I do, yes. So, you might think, why on earth would you start this? So, this will answer some of that question. The numbness that engulfs me in the wake of Marcus's death in 2017 subsides as summer sets in and gives way to an overwhelming desire to change my life in as many ways as possible. I've been angling for a solo adventure since cycling the Troglostein uh, mountain path in Norway the year before, camping in the lush undergrowth along the way, but something was holding me back. I'm far from the best kayaker in the club, yet people with less skill have been on big adventures. Over the course of a few years and many trips, I've developed the kind of reliance on deep friendships only attainable when you spend a lot of time problem solving together. It is easier and more fun to do things with others, even if it's less of a challenge. Marcus's death changed that, and as I drift through the rest of the year, I realize now is the time for a proper solo adventure. But what? The devastating outcome of the Brexit referendum has placed the division of the UK from the rest of Europe on the horizon. And it's starting to feel like sauntering around Europe in a kayak might not be as easy in the future as it is today. In this time of disconnection, it feels more important to connect. It dawns on me that the shipping forecast is one of the ways our island is connected to its neighbours. And to also help set the scene a bit more, you have a clip. Can you tell us about that? I do, yes. Well, Toby, before he started his trip, um, managed to somehow suck up to the BBC <laughs> and get the travel show to come along and do a, a tiny little documentary on him. And so I, I'd like to play that. Um, it may be upsetting for some of you who maybe knew Toby because you're going to see him on the big screen. I like this clip because it, it shows him in the prime of life, in a moment where he was really excited to go on this trip. And it really reminds me of that's who he was, not, not the person at the end of his life. So let me show you that, and it'll set up a little bit the story as well. well that's Toby. This is the clip. I think one of the really exciting things about going in a kayak on the sea is a sense of simplicity that is about just being very close to the water, and it's a a human-powered movement. You can use the environment to your advantage or disadvantage.
I'm Toby Carr and over the next year I'm going to kayak in all of the areas of the shipping forecast. And now the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. There are warnings of gales in southeast Iceland. High Norwegian Basin 1029, expected 40s 1030 by midnight tonight. The shipping forecast in the UK is the world's first storm warning system. It covers an area from the south coast of Iceland and mid-Atlantic in the west to the Danish coast in the east, right down to the north coast of Africa. Portland, Plymouth, North Biscay. Northerly or northeasterly, four or five. Showers later, good. It's broadcast several times during the day on BBC Radio 4. So it's a pretty big undertaking to paddle in all the areas. The funny thing about the shipping forecast is that I think so few people understand its actual meaning or relevance, but so many people love it and enjoy listening to it. So there's this funny balance between its meaning and its, or its practical meaning and its cultural meaning in a way. South Biscay, variable three or four. The showers. radio was on quite a lot in our house right, where I grew up, and so in a way it was a bit of a background. So you'd hear this regular rhythm of something being read out. East Seoul, Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea. Whilst I was growing up, we had a, um, a small boat on the east coast of England. Because of that, we also grown up listening to the forecast having a real meaning and uh, trying to understand what it would mean and writing it down. So I've got two days to go. I'm going through all my stuff. It's a bit daunting because I've got to get all of this stuff into a kayak. So I'm just trying to go through what I can take, what I can leave. This is a personal locator beacon. If something goes really badly wrong, this is registered with the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency in Falmouth and it is connected to um, an international rescue system. So you pull up the antenna and you do the thing that you hope you're never going to have to do, which is push the red button here. So push the button and like a whole fleet of helicopters turns up or something. I grew up listening to the rare genetic condition which my brother also had and when we were kids we were often told that we wouldn't live longer than 30 and the life expectancy is quite short. So I think that obviously puts in your mind a sense of determination to try and get the most out of things. You have a sense of freedom. You can get to places that people can't normally get to, so there's a remote aspect to it, I think, which is appealing. There's also a point of perspective, I think, that being on the water and looking back at the land is quite an interesting way to experience it. Pharaohs, southerly, four or five, occasionally six in west, occasional rain in west, mainly good. People have just contacted me from other places and got on board with the project, offered places to stay, offered to plan different bits of the trip, offered to lend me boats or equipment, kind of offers of meals, all sorts of things, and you share a love for doing something. There's a side to it which is also really important to me, which is meeting people in these different places, and, and I think that's what will bring the trip alive. final edit bit was mine, actually. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I picked on that, I've never seen the person that does the shipping forecast, and it felt a bit weird. <laughs> Seeing him, I was like, I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> so what happened, happened after this was filmed? So Toby, in the summer of 2018, set out. He went first to southeast Iceland, and then uh, from there went down to the Faroes. I think I can get my map to show you this as well. Um, to the Faroe Islands, then he went across to North at Sierra, South at Sierra, Fisher, German Bight, and Humber. Um, he didn't kayak 
entire coastlines and he didn't do the long voyages by kayak either. Those of you that are kayakers will know that you definitely wouldn't want to be kayaking <laughs> to Southeast Iceland. Um, and he had quite different adventures in all of the different places. I think I wanted to share, if possible, um, the Faroe Islands uh, yes. video. Is that all right? Yeah, that's absolutely... Good right. <laughs> um, the Faroe Islands is, is obviously one of the places that uh, not that many people go to, so I think it's quite a nice, um, a nice one to show. I put together videos after I'd written the book and was then sort of wondering what shall I do now. I put together videos based on Toby's hours and hours of GoPro, um, which was fun to watch um, sometimes. And, and this is one of those, so don't expect the standard to be the same as that of the BBC. <laughs> The wind's going a bit crazy. The sea is mental. But I feel like I've had my fill of Faroese kayaking. It's pretty tough. And it's on the border of being enjoyable, really. I'm hoping that I can get a more positive view of the Faroe Islands tomorrow. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's a, an amazing place. I, I think it's just quite hostile. Arrows. Westerly 5 to 7, occasionally gale 8 at first, going northwesterly 3 or 4. Rain or showers, good occasionally poor. Reading both the book and watching that video, Pharaoh's definitely was incredibly hard work for him. Yeah, I think it was one of the hardest places he went to. And yeah, some of it was a holiday. Uh, there <laughs> were parts where he was uh, paddling through the Frisian Islands, for example, in Germany where it was, it was just really hot and nice. And the biggest problem he had there was he hadn't really calculated very well the tides and so almost ran out of water. Um, but yeah, there was, it's, it's very different between the different areas um, and the different experiences, obviously. And that, that winter, um, that uh, part of it, Toby completed four more areas. Yes. He then, instead of sort of staying at home and having a nice winter. He decided to keep going. Um, he completed Thames, Dover, White, and Portland. And by completed, it's, it's a little bit different. He, he essentially decided that he would kayak, sea kayak in all of the areas of the shipping forecast. And what that meant was having at least one proper paddle in those places. In most of them, he had several. In some of them, he did entire coastlines in three or four weeks. Um, but, yeah, as you'll find out later, luckily for me, that was the, the idea of the challenge. <laughs> You've put together uh, more videos of each of the areas. Could we show one now? We could show one now. Um, this is some nice pictures of the Ekrahos. <laughs> this is, um, this is in, in 2019. He then continued his journey. There is a video coming it's up. It's okay. <laughs> um, in 2019, he continued his journey, um, summer 2019. He, he, stopped, he worked as an architect and was trying to balance this kind of exploration and all the rest of it with his proper job. Um, and left in order to be able to do this. And so that year, 2019, he um, went to Biscay, Fitzroy, and Trafalgar 
These are some of the really the biggest areas of the shipping forecast, as you can see there. Um, and I'd like to show you the Biscay video. Um, he went to Biscay in two parts. He went, first of all, to um, Brittany uh, with his friend Mikhail, who you'll see in the videos, and then later got, the, the, uh, got a ferry down to Santander and started his journey around the top corner of Spain from Santander. So you're going to see both of those parts of Biscay. variable 4 or 5, occasionally 6 at first in north, then decreasing 3 at times. Thundery showers, fog patches. Moderate, occasionally very poor. <laughs> Hay un camino que a mí me lleva con toda la ansia a la añoranza de un viejo hogar. Hay un camino que tras la niebla llega a mi infancia y aún en sueño crepuscular. Not quite sure what I was expecting from this part of the North Spanish coast in Asturias and, and also in Cantabria, but it's this incredible coastline. You can see around me it's limestone and it forms these amazing caves and arches. The sound of the waves crashing against the, the rocks is brilliant. <laughs> This gate, northerly two to three, becoming easterly three to four later. There, good. You see, he gets more and more confident with the forecast as he goes <laughs> along. <laughs> After doing two. Uh, uh, Two of the largest areas he still wasn't done what are his plans after that area so yeah he in 2019 he went back and basically he's still got a pretty massive area left to do which is um I, all of the irish sea areas and then scotland and his plan was to do that in 2020 now we all know what happened in 2020 and that obviously wasn't to be. Um, but what he did do in 2020, once he'd gone through, well, we'd all gone through the pandemic, was to be able to tick off uh, Plymouth, Seoul and Lundy. He'd moved down to Cornwall by this point. Um, so it was sort of his home territory and paddled all the way up to Plymouth, um, as far as I know, to avoid paying for parking in Plymouth, <laughs> uh, and then paddled all the way back down um, to Senan, the, just round from Land's End. And then sitting on the beach there, sort of thought, well, looks like I've got a weather window. I can probably get out to the Scilly Isles, which are about 35 kilometers off the point of Land's End. So did that, and then tried to sort of tack on a little bit of Lundy as well. And that was 
that was pretty much uh, where his journey ended. One of the wonderful things that you put across so beautifully in the book and we've seen in the videos is that each shipping cast each shipping forecast area is a chapter in the book and how different they are. Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously the areas are quite different anyway, geographically and um, just in terms of the countries that they're covering. But also Toby's experience was very different. He started the, the journey thinking he wanted a solo adventure, but knowing he wasn't going to do that alone all the time. So there were moments where, yes, he was doing long days of paddling alone, like in um, Faroe Islands or in Southeast Iceland. But then there were others where he was either joined with so by someone else or he'd have a group of people. And the book very much tries to capture that sense of community, of sea kayakers, of just people that kind of helped him. And I know that's something that was really important to him. It was something that was reflected in his notes. And it was something that I got also when I then interviewed all the people that he'd met, uh, that this was, this was an important part of it. It wasn't just about the sense of place or about the adventure, but also about this community. This, this book is obviously about adventure and travel, but it's also a book about grief. Yes. The book starts with the loss of your brother Marcus, and you, and you don't shy away from addressing grief. Can you expand on that? Yeah, I mean, um, it's something that I've had to deal with personally a lot. This is a family photo of mine from uh, 1987, I think. And uh, basically, I'm the only one left of my family. My mum is still alive, but she has a mental illness. So it's essentially, grief is something that I've lived with. And I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it at all in any way. But I think it's something we often shy away from talking about as a society. And I wanted to put it in the book, um, both in terms of something that I've lived and something that Toby lived. In Toby's case, and, and actually in my case now, he found an immense solace in nature and in adventure and just going and doing these things and often being at the mercy of the sea and um, feeling bigger forces at work, I think. And so it's something that I've... Yeah, woven through the book uh, in terms of Toby reflecting on Marcus during his journey. And of course, I don't know exactly when he would have done this. There are moments in his notes where he'd written um, thought of Marcus today when this happened. And that, of course, I've been able to capture. But there are other times when I've had to infer that. And that's come from my own dealing with grief and how well I knew Toby, and also from things like emails and WhatsApps. He was much more emotional, let's say, there than in his notes or, or anything else. You have a reading that captures an, an essence of this. Would you like to share that with us? I do have a reading, yes. <clears throat> At other times, I find myself thinking of Marcus, scenes with him flicking through my mind, me proudly handing over a bottle of elderflower champagne I'd made and decanted into an Ikea bottle. I would later find out it had exploded, narrowly missing Marcus and Andy. Marcus's calm, professional approach deal with dealing with our, our mum, Bron, whose mental illness leads her to make up all sorts of untrue stories about us, which Katie and I find difficult to manage. Marcus and Andy looking after me, feeding me soup and supplying me with newspapers in their cottage in Suffolk, after my mouth cancer operation six years ago. Most of all, I think about his resilience at the end. He'd been plagued by cancer for 13 years on and off. Each time it came back, it took a, a little more of him away. Generally, he just got on with things, like being a doctor, seeing the world, and living as much as he could. I remember only one time when his determination broke in front of me. In March last year, as the scarf around his neck stopped us from seeing the cancer eating away at him, Katie came over with her three-week-old son, Jorenz, so that they could meet. He was a tiny piece of hope in an otherwise bleak world. Sitting on the sofa in the comfort of Mandy's, the house we had come to consider our new family home, Marcus burst into tears. It's just so hard, he wrote, because by then he could no longer speak. We fought back our tears and the utter sense of impotence, only able to hug his skeletal frame and say, I know. Tears rolled down my cheeks off the desolate coast of Denmark, 
I try to, fo try to focus on something else. I stop for a moment to shout at the sea. It's beginning to be a bit more challenging and deserves a telling off anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Katie. Right. You can see a bit there, there's, the, there's quite a lot of humour in the book. So I don't want you to get the idea that it's sort of all about grief and death and cancer and horrible things. Um, it's actually trying to, trying to face that and, and respect it and say this is really hard to deal with, but at the same time, allowing a sense of fun and a sense of adventure in, in lots of different interpretations of the word adventure. It's just very human part of the human experience. This wonderful book, it took you a year. Six months of research, pulling together Toby's notes, like you say, WhatsApps, emails, videos, and then six months, six months writing and editing. Can you expand on that? Did you have a process? Yeah, so um, I never spoke with Toby about writing his book, um, and I think he'd be quite frankly surprised <laughs> um, and it, it felt like it was not something we could talk about towards the end of his life because it, it was admitting you know really that he wasn't going to have the time to do it and that was one of the only sort of hopeful things that he had towards the end um, so after I'd sorted out his estate and the house and things like that I, I thought well you know, I could write his book. And a few of his friends had been kind of inspiring me to do it. Um, and I just sat down and started looking at his notes. This, this is the notebook, one of his notebooks. He had, um, I think, six different notebooks. When he was traveling, he'd write down notes every three days. And it wasn't like a logbook. It was very much more detailed than that. A lot of description, uh, a lot of information about yeah, what he was seeing. Yeah, sadly, not that much information about the routes. So I spent quite a lot of time on Google Maps pinpointing every single stop, you know, where he camped each night. Some of that was good because I could get it off the photos that he'd taken from his iPhone on land because it had geolocalization. So, you know, I could then stick the points <laughs> in. Others, he'd taken it on his waterproof camera, which had no geolocalization. So therefore, I was looking at photos of lighthouses and then Googling lighthouses <laughs> off the coast of Denmark and <laughs> trying to match up these photos. Um, and eventually did it. I spent quite a long time planning that route out um, and making sure that I was very clear. I knew from the beginning I wanted it to be proper nonfiction, um, narrative nonfiction, and also that if I didn't get it right, he'd met so many people that it would just be really annoying to read the book and then go, oh, but you know, he didn't do that, he did something else. Um, so it took me a long time to figure out what he'd done. It was essentially kind of getting to the same place that he would have been in had he written it. Um, and by that time, I then had everything digitalized. So I'd, I wrote down notes, um, sort of wrote down the notes that were in the notebooks and transcribed a lot of recordings. He'd done a lot of uh, recordings on his phone, interviewing people and just chatting about different plans which was great because there's a lot of direct speech in the book and that's where that direct speech came from. Those conversations where he was sat at a kitchen table in Spain and just sort of put his phone down there and they talked about, you know, where's the best place to paddle along this piece of coast and I could get all of those, those conversations out of that. Um, so once I'd done that and I'd got to that stage, I could then start the creative part. Um, I had, like, once that was all digitalized, about 100,000 words, oh. which is quite a big document. <laughs> and also, and most books are sort of 80, 80 to 90,000, and they're quite strict about it because they don't want the, um, the, the spine to be too thick, otherwise people don't read them, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> um, so, so I had to trim that down, and as soon as I started, I thought, I've, I'm just going to have to open another document and start again and, and sort of really put my own creative process on it. That was hard to do in the beginning. Um, there, were, there were sort of finished writings from Toby, in a way, um, which were three chapters that he'd written um, in his book proposal. And there were some others that I knew he liked and so, from his blogs. And so I tried to incorporate them in as well. Um, 
in the beginning, I just put all the blogs in the first part of the book. I was like, okay, done. He's done that bit. <laughs> 30,000 words done. Um, as you can imagine, the editors were like, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> a blog that is written halfway around the shipping forecast is not a properly written chapter. Um, and of course it wasn't. In, in the chapters, we we're trying to balance you know, the sense of place which Toby had in his blog, but also the conversations, the feelings, um, the history of the places, weaving through the history of the shipping forecast as well, for anyone who doesn't know it that well. Um, and so trying to sort of combine all of that was more the creative process, um, which was fun, actually, although quite <coughs> grueling at times. Um, does that answer the question? It, it does, yeah. yeah, yeah good. <laughs> <laughs> so if you touched on then the origins of the the birth, the origins of the proposal of the book was that Toby sent off a sample piece. Yeah. Can you tell us about how that came about? Yeah, so um, basically, as some of you probably know, it, when you want to write a book, you can either write the entire book and then send it to the publishers, or you can write a proposal. And the proposal is uh, a chapter list and then usually three sample chapters, which are not the first three chapters in the book. And so he'd done this. He'd actually put it together at the end of 2019 um, and was sort of, and he'd found an agent and he'd started getting it out there. And fortunately, yeah, 2020, disaster for publishing as well. So um, didn't get any bites on that. But he did get a bite um, in 2021, June 2021. Actually, the first week, or the same week that he got his cancer diagnosis, his final cancer diagnosis, um, he got this message from his agent saying, you know, Summersdale are interested in your book. Can we just revise the proposal? And it was one of those things that, well, it was probably the only thing that was hopeful at that time um, that he might be able to tell his story. And he didn't know that he had less than six months left, um, but he was able to kind of dream about writing this book. And yeah, he didn't actually progress any further than the proposal because of his illness. And knowing now what it is to write a book, I completely understand that. You need to be in a, in a really kind of good mental place in order to go back and look at different times, uh, which may have been better times in your life. Um, so, yeah, when, I, when, when he died and I was finally looking at what he'd done, there was on his on his computer, there was a, a, a file called um, Moderate Becoming Good Later. And I was like, brilliant. This is where, this is where all the work is. And I uh, opened it up, and it was just completely empty. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then I had to kind of scratch around, trying to find all of the different things. Um, but it was, it was kind of fun. It was like, a, I felt like a detective, um, and really kind of tracking his, his movements, and then trying to put it in this voice and, and yeah, make it somewhere near the book that he might have written. Well, you do weave his words from his adventures and your writing together beautifully, especially at the end. Would you mind giving us a reading from the end of the book for us? Yes. Um, let me, I think this is the one that goes with this. It is marked, but for some reason, I'm not getting it. There we go. Cornish sunsets, sunrises, and clear night skies become my tonic to an ache which develops in my shoulder and eventually shifts into a realization that I'm not very well. <coughs> COVID restrictions are relaxed and the university reopens. I'm expected to go into work. The white blossom in the department gardens is a piteousness of doves perched on dead leafless branches, a spring that I find hard to enjoy when all I want to do is sleep. My test reveals stranger than normal blood results, but there's hope I'm getting this sorted out. Palmed off with some antibiotics and the diagnosis of an infection by the GP, I start to think it's something more. A storm is brewing on the horizon, and there is little I can do about it but follow protocol and rest. I have the feeling of waiting to be rescued that I've never felt in my kayak. Thank you. And then you found a message on Toby's computer. I did, yes. Yeah. So um, I eventually figured out his passwords because um, <laughs> <laughs> that's always a bit of a challenge. If you want a piece of advice, make sure you've got your passwords somewhere. <laughs> um, I figured out the passwords. And on his computer, on the desktop, there was 
a new piece of writing that he'd done just four days before he died. Um, and it was called How It Ends. And this is not in the book um, because it didn't really fit into the structure of the end of it. Uh, but it is something that gave me a lot of clues as to how he wanted the book to be written. Um, so he said, I never wanted it to be become a story of a trip ending with some kind of revelation or personal discovery. Life isn't like that, even if we want it to be. I started out making my own rules and challenges for the journey. And with a big undertaking, how can we really know how it ends? And why would we even want to? So with that, I knew that I shouldn't, wouldn't, um, put in lots of messages in the book, which is quite a challenge for me because one of my previous roles was in corporate communication where you have <laughs> really clear ideas of what the message is and then put it into the writing. Um, I needed to be very clear that there isn't one message in this book that we want you to take away from it. And there isn't any writing that says, and I realized, blah, 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 blah. Um, because I knew that Toby didn't want that. And the more I thought about that piece of writing that was on his computer, the more I was sure that's, that's how he would have written it. Um, and so, yeah, you can take from the book what you want, really. Um, I like to think it's hopeful, though. That's, that's the main thing. I, I think guess. it is. <laughs> I think it is. And you've touched on just then and a few times previously that you're writing in someone else's voice. What is that like? Yeah, so um, I think, uh, first of all, a lot of people write in other people's voices uh, in fiction. But in non-fiction, it's less, less normal. Um, I studied drama originally, and so I was trained to be able to act using someone else's voice. And I think that helped a lot. It also helped that Toby was my brother. I knew him really well. And so I was able to imagine what he would have said and what he would have done. And actually, I, I found it easier to write in his voice than I am finding it now to write in my own voice. Because when you're writing for somebody else, you're not kind of thinking, oh, you know, do I look like an idiot? Do all people like me? You know, because you can see it from outside anyway. And you're like, oh, yeah, he sounds good here. We want to, we want to make him sound good, but not, not angelic. You know, he is my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so when you handed in the final draft, that is when you decided to carry on the challenge. Yes, so I'd handed in the final draft, and because I'd been just focused on that, and I did all the maps in the book as well, so <laughs> I'd, I'd done the draft, I'd handed it in whilst, I was, whilst it was getting edited, I'd done all of the maps, and then um, I'd got it back, and so it had been this really long process. <laughs> and I kind of, I don't know what to do with myself now. <laughs> and um, and I, I just wanted to get outside, and I think that's, partly because I'd spent so long kind of encouraging other people in the book to go outside. I was like, oh, I really want to go outside. If, if only I had something I could do, some challenge. <laughs> um, and I, I obviously realized that there was a challenge there that hadn't been finished, which is Toby's shipping forecast challenge. And at the time, there were uh, 10 areas that he hadn't been to. And um, so I decided to do it. I spoke with my aunt, Nikki, who's a proper sea kayaker. Um, I had not been in a sea kayak, by the way, at this point. Um, I'd asked lots and lots of questions to lots and lots of sea kayakers and tried to find out exactly, you know, typical thing, sort of, if you're sitting in the kayak and you want your lunch, but you're on the middle of the sea, where is it? Where do you have it? You know, is it in the... Fr you know, they're like, OK, well, you're probably just eating, you know, um, Haribo's and uh, an energy bars from your buoyancy aid, but you might have something good in the hatch in the front. I'm like, OK. Now I can understand and imagine sitting there, but I hadn't, I hadn't been in a sea kayak. Um, so I was basically imagining doing this challenge of sea kayaking on all the areas of the shipping forecast or finishing it, having never been in a sea kayak. Um, and I spoke to my aunt Nikki about it, who's here today. And um, I think that we both came to the realization that it was gonna be possible for me, one of the main things was bearing in mind that people learn to kayak in all of these areas. Um, the, the scariest area maybe is the west of Ireland. Um, and yet, you can go and learn to sea kayak in the west of Ireland. So I had this choice of whether to start straight away and you know, do it, but in a kind of a, 
I'm trying not to say a rubbish version of my brother's challenge, um, but a different version of my brother's challenge, or to try and learn to ski kayak and then start it. And I just thought, well, I, I want to go outside. I want to finish this challenge. And you know what? Maybe we can have adventures even if we are not having it with a capital A and going out and you know discovering new places. Maybe it's about what is an adventure for me. And for me, going to these places and going out with other people um, was a big adventure and is still being a big adventure and learning to see kayak along the way. Um, so yeah, I started, that's Toby. Um, I started in, um, in Lundy in, are you sorry, you didn't, I'm just going on. That's okay. That's, <laughs> no, look, I'd like to say that this is in January this year. Yeah, so January in this Amazing. year, I went in a sea kayak for the first time. I live <laughs> in Barcelona, so it's slightly nicer weather to go sea kayaking <laughs> in Barcelona in January. And um, I thought, actually, this is quite nice, which is a big relief, because I'd already put on social media that I was going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then in March, I, I started in the shipping forecast in Toby's kayak. So I went down to Cornwall, picked up the kayak, and met up with a load of people in Bristol. Um, I decided to frame the challenge in my own way. I've got to be sensible, um, not take too many risks, go out with people who are excellent sea kayakers, um, making sure that I'm pushing myself, but at the same time keeping it safe. And, um, and I wanted to start in Bristol because I went to university in Bristol. So it was sort of trying to put my mark on the challenge, but keep it within Toby's framework. So. Um, I started in Bristol, and then I, um, in May, I came back and went to Wales. I went out in Pembrokeshire a couple of times, and then in Anglesey, and then took the kayak on the ferry to Ireland and left it in Dublin for a while before planning my family holiday around going kayaking in Ireland. <laughs> um, I've got two small kids, and they absolutely loved it. We went on the ferry from Spain and ran went into Ross Lair, picked up the kayak, and then we went out in several different places around Ireland. And it was just, Ireland especially was a brilliant experience um, because people were just so lovely. It sounds like a total cliche, right? Mm -hmm. People were lovely in Ireland. I can tell us something we don't know. Um, they were, no, but they, they were lovely because they didn't know Toby. They didn't really know me. And yet I got into the Irish Sea Kayaking Association and they just supported me in all these different places. Um, and it felt like it became my adventure. And um, my kids were involved in it as well. They obviously didn't sit in the hatch in the front of the <laughs> kayak or anything, although it was tempting at times. <laughs> Um, but they, you know, they loved having the kayak on the car and getting it, helping me down the slipway with it. And, you know, mummy's, where's mummy going? She's gone paddling again. <laughs> um, and they got left on a beach somewhere with my partner. <laughs> so, and then, we, then after that, we went, I uh, went up to the, to Scotland. I took it back across, um, on the ferry to Stranra and, um, and then went in the Hebrides and so, so that I could tick off Malin and Hebrides. Um, and we did, I think, three or four different paddles that, that time with, with my aunt Nikki, and that was brilliant as well. Just some amazing experiences, and it, it's really opened up a lot of places that I perhaps never would have gone to, and also just some amazing experiences that are not the type that you put on Facebook and go, wow, I had an amazing experience in the rain today, but it just is one of the best things you can possibly do on a rainy grey day is go kayaking. Because you're going to get wet anyway. I'm to agree, yeah. <laughs> um, so you touched on then that you are a mother and you have a job. Yeah. And you're also still writing, you're learning to paddle. And we all know from the world of adventure, we do have to balance being a grown-up and an adult and going out and adventuring. What's it been like for you, you know, trying to balance and plan all of this? Maybe I should get my partner on stage. <laughs> He's not here. He's in Barcelona looking after the kids. Um, it's, been, it's been a challenge. I think it's, it's quite difficult to be able to put the boundaries and go, I'm going to do this. And that means that you're gonna get, you need to get extra support or you have to, in this case, I, basically my partner's been really supportive and he basically just gets the kids 100% whilst I'm not there. Um, which is fine. I mean, he's their dad, so 
you know, that's, that's okay. Um, but it is quite difficult, I think, mentally, probably especially for women to deal with this, because we feel like we should be there with the kids all the time, and maybe, you know, going out paddling in some kind of slightly stormy weather in Ireland isn't what a good mother does. Um, so it's, it's, it can be a challenge that, and I, I wouldn't say I've got a solution to it other than just kind of ignoring it and keeping going, which has <laughs> pretty much been my way of dealing with lots of different things. Um, and also, I guess, getting the kids involved in it as well. And in my case, obviously, it helps that there's this bigger story, and it's Toby's journey, and essentially my partner can't really argue with a dead brother, so it's... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but he will probably be quite pleased when it's over next year. <laughs> so that leads us nicely into, it is a bit of a cliched question, but I would love to, for you to tell us all what is next as part of the challenge. What is next? So you can see on this map, um, what uh, these are the areas left. Um, there are four areas that have no land, which... <laughs> Toby basically had some slight plans for involving helicopters, oil rigs, things like that. Um, I've also spoken to a few people who have encouraged me to get in contact with some cruise companies that I could, you know, take the kayak out in the middle of Bailey or something. But uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I'm going to do those. Neither was he. So uh, at the moment, I'm leaving those to the side. But the ones I will complete next year are Tyne, Forth, Cromarty, and Fair Isle. So um, the Tyne one I'll probably do in April. I, I still haven't sort of finalized the plans for this. I'd like to go to... Um, Linda's Farn and Holy Island and somewhere around there because I hear it's really beautiful to paddle. Um, in fourth, I'd like to do a sort of beginner's paddle. Um, I mean, it sounds kind of like, oh, the rest of it, I was really professional, so I'll do a beginner's <laughs> one now. But the idea with this is to get... There are a lot of people who've read the book or friends of mine who've never kayaked before and think it's sort of something, oh, it's sort of a really difficult distant thing and I think some of the stuff Toby did obviously was I'm not going to take them to the Faroe Islands um, but it's actually really nice just to try out and obviously look at the weather forecast go out with expert people but I'm thinking of doing sort of a beginner's one to get more people involved in that and then Cromarty I've got no idea what I'm doing and <laughs> Fair Isle I'm going to be up in the Shetlands kayak symposium so that's in July that's, that's pretty much where it will end. And hopefully then the skies will open and Toby will appear. <laughs> and there we go. Job done. <laughs> so not, not, not a quiet year next year. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, my partner's like, um, when is this done? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so we did say earlier, this is also a bit of a plug. If anyone wants to join Katie in any of these areas or has any suggestions... Yeah, that would be... I mean, I basically haven't set this up. I don't go out on my own. And um, there are some bits where I've got some ideas of people to paddle with, but others that I don't. So if you're interested in being involved in any way, I'm really happy to, to talk to people about it. Wonderful. And one of the most poignant for me whilst reading the book, um, and I'd love to ask you to do one more reading for us, is some of the final words in the book. Right. Yeah, I've got some more pictures here, but I'm not sure what they are. <laughs> I just oh, some of me kayaking. Oh. <laughs> um, right. So this is the final word in the book. It's not. It's not a spoiler, really. I mean, this is something interesting about this book. It's. It's kind of. Um, in the beginning, you already know how the story ends. So there's a challenge there as a writer mm. that the essential question has already been answered. He's not around at the end. So, you know, what, how do you deal with that? Anyway, sorry. No, it still, it still shocked me. I don't know. I was like, oh, no. But Yeah. <laughs> so this is not the book that Toby would have written, but it is cl as close as I can get to it. A co-creation about his experience where his words are mixed with mine to tell his story as best we can. For me, this book is a way to keep Toby alive, letting him continue to inspire others to find and start their adventures. And I can... Is this a spoiler if we let people know your next writing project? 
Yes, I am. I am essentially working on a sequel to this book. But I was told never to bring that up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, in, on stage, I was told never to bring that up because then people don't buy this book. They wait for the other one to come out so they can read both of them at the same time. Oh, I definitely recommend reading that book. I think I've read it about four times this year and have cried every time oh. and laughed. So yeah, I yeah, do recommend reading my book. <laughs> so we have just under 10 minutes left, and I would love to open the floor up to questions. Um, it's a small room, so um, we're not going to run around with microphones. So if you'd like to ask a question, if you're able to, I'd love you to stand up, use your big voice, and uh, yeah, lady in the green top. So, yeah, I was just curious, would, do you think Toby would have ever anticipated that you would do this? Just um, gonna, sorry, just repeat that. Yeah. So she's asking if Toby would have anticipated Katie would have done this. Yes and no. Um, Toby and I were both, we kind of similar characters in some ways of just doing projects and making them a reality. He wouldn't have doubted that I would be capable of doing it. I think he would still be a little bit surprised. Um, the book, I think, is one thing. that, And then the journey itself. I mean, one of my biggest regrets, I guess, is that I never went paddling with Toby. Um, for me, it was this thing he did, and it seemed quite distant. And I, you know, I had very young babies at that point anyway, and so it was like there was no way I could do that. And it just sort of coincided that I, the kids were sort of old enough to, for me to be able to go and do other things. Um, but yeah, we never paddled together, so I think that bit he might have been quite surprised about. But but again, he wouldn't have been like, oh my god, that's such a surprise that my <laughs> sister did something slightly crazy. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, strike it up. Um, obviously, it took like six months to do all the research. So I was just wondering, did it almost feel like you went on the journey with, with him? Because obviously, you've had to talk to all the people and you've really <coughs> seen the places that people have been to. And did that prepare you at all for then going out and doing it yourself? So, yeah, based on all of the research, all the collaborations, wondering if it felt like Katie went on the journey with him. Yeah, it's a really nice question, actually, because it did feel like that. And it, I was around when he was on these journeys. My first son was born in 2017. Uh, <laughs> and 2019, my second son was born. So I was literally nursing a baby when he was in his second, the second part of his trip. And I was sort of following what he was doing, but I didn't know all of the stories behind it. Um, so it almost felt like spending an extra year with Toby and really getting to know what he'd done in these places. And I think a really nice thing that came out of the book was that I was able to remember him as he was during his most of his life. Um, those of you that have sadly accompanied people through end of life or cancer will know that it's, it's a decline and it's actually quite difficult towards the end to remember what that person really was like before they became quite ill. Um, so being able to go back and be with him in a way at these moments where they were the most joyous moments of his life. He was out there in nature. He was exploring. He was battling with the elements and camping on beaches with beautiful sunsets. And so, you know, it was, it was a lovely thing to be able to do. And I, I feel privileged to have been able to do that because I had some money saved up so I could, I could sort of reduce my work and, and focus on that. Um, but it did, in a way, bring him back. And I hope it kind of brings him back for people that knew him. It's also a way of going, oh, you, you know, this is... Toby's in a book now. He's not alive, but he is in a book. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Joe at the back. I would love to. Sorry, that's... No, no, it's just uh, praising Katie's storytelling. I wonder if it's going to be an audible version of the book. I would love to do that because it makes it more accessible. Unfortunately, it's not my call to make. Mm -hmm. I'm pressuring the publishers a little <laughs> bit with this. We'll set up a petition. Um, I'll send it round. It's being slightly helped by... The BBC are doing a, um, a documentary, actually. and uh, So they're doing it for the travel show, but they're going to make a longer one, a 20-minute one. And they're sort of following some of my trip this year and next year. And so I'm trying to link it to that and go, you know, the BBC are going to do this. You should really have the audio, <laughs> audio book ready to be bought when that comes out. Mm. Let's see. <laughs> Questions? 
Who's that? that? Pink top over there. Hi. Hi. Obviously, you got introduced to Sea Kayaking because you were following your brother's journey. I'd just like to ask you, what's kept you going back into a sea kayak? What do you actually enjoy about it? Mm, just asking why, what is keeping Katie going back into a sea kayak? Uh, well, I haven't finished the journey. <laughs> no. Um, what I, what I love about it is that being so close to the water and nature, and it's, there's just some extremely special moments. Like, I'm just thinking of a moment in, in Scotland in the summer, and we'd camped out, first wild camping I'd ever done, um, and in the morning, it was just this really gray, misty morning, but absolutely um, calm water and sort of gliding onto that was just an amazing experience we're in the middle of these massive mountains um, yeah it's raining a bit but it's it's absolutely stunningly beautiful and there's this moment of complete calm where you can just be in nature and that's okay I think there's just this yeah, there's a special thing about being on the water. There's also moments where you feel challenged. I think that that's, that's the nice thing about it as well, that you're, it's not all kind of gliding around going, oh, this is nice. <laughs> there's moments where, you know, particularly with my skill level, I'm, I'm sort of, okay, I'm at the limit of my skill level. And there was one time in Ireland where we'd paddled out through this lock and, you know, it was, it was beautiful and it was quite calm. It was sort of building up, building up. Got out into the open sea. There were quite big waves for me, probably about a metre and a half, two metres. So for any of you out there, you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, but, they, you know, I was a little bit uncomfortable and the guy who was leading it was like... I think we should probably go back now. So I, I did my best kind of sweep stroke, which I'd only learned like a few weeks before and went and paddled as fast as I possibly could back into the mouth of the river. But it was great to be able to do it and to feel like I was sort of pushing myself as well. So I think there's this kind of massive range of experience that you can get on the water. Um, and But most of it is about this sort of joy of being alone or nearly alone or quiet, contemplative in nature, and also being kind of a little bit at the whim of what might happen. We're going to, we've got time for one last uh, public question, if you will, but there will also be a book signing after, so this isn't your last chance to ask Katie a question. I'm going to take one more. Oh, no one's looking. Oh, the lady at the front. No, I, I mean, I'd like to actually get good at it, you know. <laughs> like, I've seen what people can do when they feel a bit more comfortable and they can, you know, go out and play in the big waves and things. So, no, I don't think it'll be the end of the journey. Um, I, you know, inherited three sea kayaks, which was part of the decision, like, oh, what, what shall I do with these boats, you know? <laughs> um, so I think I'll, I'll continue sea kayaking. I'd like to be able to... Um, yeah, get better at it and maybe even kayak more around where I live. So just sort of staying at home. I'm lucky enough to live right next to the sea and some really beautiful coastlines. So probably staying there for a little bit. Thanks. Thank you very much. And that's all we have time for. Can we have a massive round of applause for Katie? Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for joining us. We know in the world at the minute it is hard to find these aspects of joy and it's not the best economy, so we really do appreciate you taking your time out of your day and your lives to come and join us at Kendall Mountain Festival and Kendall Mountain Book Festival. There will be a book sign afterwards. Katie will be at the back. And, yes, thank you all again. <laughs>